talking about video games. Yeah! Hello, everyone listening on the internet, in your car, or just in your headphones. When you're on a run, assuming you're a runner and somebody who takes care of their own body, unlike me. Uh, this is the Namek vs. Saiyan podcast. I am Patrick Shanley, editor with The Hollywood Reporter, and one of your hosts. The other host is my good friend Edmund Arnold. Edmund, how are you doing? I'm all right. We're recording on a Monday, so I'm off. I'm hella tired. Had to work today. And now I'm thinking about running, so I'm really tired. Oh, no. Just thinking about running is enough for you to get winded. Who runs? <laughs> what a nerd. Nobody's who, who chasing me. Himself? <laughs> like, we were put on this earth to die. Like, stop trying to prolong your life, people. All right? It's selfish. It's really selfish. My body's a temple, but it's made out of hamburger. Yeah. Eat red meat, drink soda, eat candy. My motto. Oh, I'm literally drinking a beer as we're recording this. Oops. Oh, uh, you're a terrible person. I'm literally eating Sour Patch Candies as we're recording this, so we're oh, good. Can we take a quick sidebar and just discuss how delicious Sour Patch is? Sour Patches are great. God, It's amazing. the best candy, I think. Sour... I, those like sour strips, mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, oh my god, do I know what you're talking yeah. about? Those are my favorite. Sour candy is best candy. If you have a problem with that, I will punch you right in your forehead. Yeah, anyone who hates sour candy can die. <laughs> well, somebody who's not dying is Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, Sonic is back in Sonic Mania, and Sonic Mania is the best reviewed Sonic game in 15 years, which would be surprising to me if this was 1999, but it's not. Um, <laughs> Sonic is at a rough millennium. Sonic Mania is dope, though. It is dope. I got it for Nintendo Switch, and I'm loving every minute of it. It's like I'm playing my childhood. I had a big old smile when I was doing the Green Zone. Because they just, they just lifted it right from... What did I play it on? I think I played it on my Genesis. When I, yeah, my Genesis when I first played. They just ripped it right from the Genesis. So it's awesome. It's just a return to form for Sonic? Does it just, just feel like... This is the nostalgic Sonic we all wanted. It's the same game, but they've tweaked it enough so it feels like it feels like you're playing something new. If that makes sense, like they've added new things to the game that you've never seen in a Sonic game, and it just makes everything just it just feels like a new game. I just I love it. I love it. I'm very happy with it. I feel like Sonic has had one of those weird careers where so Sonic for a while, and I don't know what the demographic of our listeners are, but if you're younger. When Eddie and I were growing up in the 90s, Sonic almost rivaled Mario. I wouldn't put him quite on the same par as Mario, but he was probably the closest to get to Mario as anybody ever did. Yeah. For a platformer, I, yeah, for a platformer, definitely. sorry. And I would think that he was, because he had the cartoon. Right. The games were wildly popular. I had a plush doll. You so had, you I, had a I, Sonic I, plush doll? I had a Sonic plush dog. I I think that Mario had a good cast of characters behind him. Yes. And I think if Sonic would have had, if Sega would have generated a better cast behind Sonic, we would have probably been playing like a Sonic adventure on a, uh, you know, like a open world Sonic game. Are you trying to say that Knuckles the Echidna is not a fantastic character? No, I'm trying to say Knuckles is one of the best characters ever. Thank you. I'm just saying that anamorphic animals P- people just can't really get into that i don't know grown grown people can't really get into that whereas mario is universal sadly there's a large subgroup of people who are very into that and you should not google that <laughs> but some stuff exists on the internet yeah I, I love that stuff i saw that csi episode about it it came out like <laughs> 10 years ago it terrified me terrified me but now i'm open for it I'm like, go for you. Do it, you. It awakened things in me, and now I spend a lot of time on those forums. L- look, look, look back at the last 15 years for Sonic. Sonic has had a he's had a rough go of it. He's kind of had to slum it a little bit. Most of his releases have been uh, handheld. He was on Game Boy Advance. He was on the Nintendo DS. It's been a lot of Game handheld Gear. things. Game Gear. Well, no, that was no, back in no, the day. No. But I mean, recently. Oh, recently it was re-releases. But yeah, right. um, but yeah, he had his heyday back in the early early 90s. And just kind of stayed there in the early 90s and never made it out. I think the last big game he had was Sonic Adventure. On the Dreamcast? On Dreamcast. Yeah. And I don't even think that was that well-reviewed when it came out. It, I don't remember. It wasn't. It's not a terrible game. and It sort of was like the closest to getting it into 3D. 
Um, cause he was, you know, it was primarily, it was a, it wasn't primarily, it was, it was just a 2D platformer and that's kind of how it came to the heyday. And Sonic Adventure was the first one to kind of mess with 3D, which is funny cause it was also years after, um, Mario did it much better on Mario 64, but I like Sonic Adventure and a lot of that is because I love the Dreamcast so, so much. I actually rebought that game recently on my Xbox cause they had it on there in the Xbox store. I bought Sonic Adventure cause I'm a sad, sad, lonely man. You're a sad, lonely man. I think Sonic Adventure was one of my favorite games when it came out. Um, but I don't, I can't remember it besides that first level where you're running from that Shamu. That's exactly what it is. We're on that. Uh, it was sort of like the beginning of Wave Race, but you're in Sonic. Yeah, it's a good that game, game. Was cool. It's all right. I think it was definitely the best one up until now. This was over 15 years ago, though. The last, I mean, the last 15 years for Sonic, there's, there's nothing. I defy you to find like a Sonic game that really stood out. Yeah, but could they make a new Sonic game that's popular? Because this is just like a rehash of their old Sonic Sonic Two. Isn't that so, what makes I, it popular, though? Or are we just, are we just that driven from a nostalgia now? I mean, we'll look at Crash Bandicoot. Well, Crash Bandicoot is still on the top. It, it is still the number one video game. I'm looking at the chart right now. Global top sellers. Crash Bandicoot has made... This is just... It's madness. Yeah, and... Yeah, I think so. And I, you, contra- Controversial. I also think that most of the video game gatekeepers that write about these things are at the age where they grew up with these games. Yeah. So that's why um, all these things are getting reviewed well. So I... But you, Sonic feels good. Sonic feels well. So, it's, you know, it's playing Sonic the Hedgehog 2 again. So it's uh, and Sonic the Hedgehog two is the Sonic that I grew up playing. Right. Well, see, I feel like you're. It's hard not to fall in that trap, right? Like why these companies could play on nostalgia. Uh, maybe they're not even doing it. Maybe the people that are working there and developing games now are starting to be in that. They're that age now too, you know. So they're even playing on nostalgia. But it is hard to review it without those rose-colored glasses on because you play oh, and absolutely. you feel like you're ten again. Yeah, because when I started playing this game, I had a fast smile on my face, and I, I went into a bias, like, oh, this is amazing. Right. Because it's playing a game that I grew up playing. Mind you, it's one of the you know the greatest platformers made, but um, it, I, I don't know. It's it's a hard one. It's a hard one, really, you know, because it's something that you grew up loving, so you can't really harp on it. Right. But it's it's... It was flawless when it came not flawless, but it was very good when it came out. They released the same thing with the minor tweaks. It's hard to knock it. It's hard to knock it. Yeah. Well, it's just I, a re- yeah. If, if, a re- yeah, it's a rehash. It's a reboot. Rehash. Yeah. But if it's still good, then what's the difference? You know, if you enjoy it and you truly enjoyed playing it, then does it does it matter that it's just rehashing things that we've already done before? No, I don't think so. And if it, you know, it's making money, and obviously they're clamoring for it, so we're just going to see more of it. Yeah, I guess so. I think that's what people. I think people are a little nervous about just we're maybe we're not getting new stuff now because people are dumping money into things we've already done, as opposed to the both existing at the same time. Which, by the way, but, is what's happening. Like things are both existing. Right, right. That's what I was going to counter you with. But we are getting new good stuff as right. well. So I think it's a perfect time to be rehashing these early platformers. So let's see yeah. Arrow the Acrobat come back. <laughs> let's see Rise Star come back. Let's see Rock. You know, let's see all these old Croc Legend. What was that game? Croc. Yeah. Let's see all these games come back. Let's get you know? Gex back. That's what I've been clamoring for. That's the, yeah. the one thing Glover. I've been pushing. Let's get Glover back. Oh my God, Glover! <laughs> I mean, why not? I mean, it's an open market. People want to see these games. I don't. I don't understand why we haven't seen a Spyro remake yet. Oh, I love Spyro so, a lot. You know, I can go on for days. We have all these, like, you know, Donkey Kong Country 2. Let, let's see them remade. Yeah. Let's see them. And, you know, this was a very intelligent $20 <laughs> digitally release only. It's intelligent. Yeah, and it worked because it's doing quite well. And, and it's cheap. It's, it's cheap. cheap. And that's exactly how you should market these games. You know, even if it's a new game, if it's a rehash, then it should be cheap. Look, there's there's tons and tons and tons of independent studios that are still making incredibly great new games that are pushing bounce. Look at the people that we've had on our show. Look at uh, Greg Cassavan uh, making Pyre. Uh, our guest this week, Steve Gaynor, um, with uh, Fulbright, and they just released Tacoma, a follow-up to Gone Home. Uh, games that are completely different than things that existed before and pushing it more into a narrative zone. Uh, these things can exist side by side. You don't you don't have to choose one. You can you can enjoy lots of them. Or you could do like I do and buy them all 
and yeah. enjoy them all, <laughs> and, just, and just spend money on that, and be single, and not have any, you know, you know, don't travel. Just spend all your money on video games. Just sit around eating all. Swedish fish and Sour Patch Kids alone in your underpants. Yeah, and cry about how great life is. So, <laughs> so yeah. as long as you're happy, then it's all good. I'm happy, you know. Yeah, you I'm got still lots alive. So <laughs> if, I, if I wasn't happy, I wouldn't be here. So uh, yeah, it's got so dark. <laughs> I think the podcast is open for some darkness here and there. I guess so. so. I just didn't expect Sonic of all characters to bring it out of you. <laughs> but yeah, it's good. It's good. I like. I want to see more of it because I need to add more games to my Nintendo Switch. And it's it's nice to see Sonic on an HD television. It's, and man, that soundtrack is. I forgot how Sonic man is. Sonic that rips, man. Is. Are you yeah, there, man. There would be no Passion Pit. Or dubstep without Sonic the Hedgehog. And that is a hot take, but I truly that's believe that. I, I, I believe that with you, too. I won't argue with that. Uh, a game that is not faring as well. I uh, got the proverbial nail in the coffin. Was uh, let's, let's have a moment of silence for Mass Effect Andromeda. Because it's pretty much done. Can we please have a moment of silence? Silence. silence. I hope it, we don't get It was all the dream. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what that was, but okay. Uh, I have no idea what rap is. I'll, I'll, your whiteness will... I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you. Your whiteness prevailed there. Um, White? But yeah, no DLC for Mass Effect Andromeda. Does anyone care at all is my question to you. Yeah. John <laughs> from Wisconsin? Let alone this Please. one random guy freezing his buns off out in Wisconsin. <laughs> well, that's all he has, you know? He has no heat. He plays, you know, sits by the television, gets his all his temperature, his warm temperature from the television, plays Mass Effect. Yeah, he punches now he has in the face. no hot, steamy romances. Nothing, nothing. What He's happened nothing. to this series? This series that started off as, like, the best thing I had seen in years and years. And it just kind of petered out with, like, this lame game that just didn't appeal to anybody. It, it was so just, buggy and so just bleh. Yeah, well, it starts with the outrage for Mass Effect 3, right? Yeah. Just, you get a bunch of people that were just upset because they don't believe that their choices matter, and then they got a subpar Mass Effect ending. I thought the ending was okay. I'm not complaining about it. It's you hard to it. wrap up a trilogy regardless, right? Like, it's hard to wrap up any type of saga. Look at look at Game of Thrones right now without getting look, That's a perfect right. example. Right. Look at Walking Dead. Oh, yeah, oh, my God. Yeah, Walking Dead is even better. Another example, example you know, Game of Thrones, Walking Dead. It's just hard to keep something. The Simpsons is hard. Right keep something going for so long and look at video game series too since we're you know making comparisons what video game series you talked about sonic right besides mario what video game series have we seen just go beyond the you know you have your resident evils well even resident evil has ups and downs too i mean seven right, was good right. but it didn't sell well well not for the last few years like think about it what video game series has made it long term and being successful Right. Besides Mario, you got. Uh, I mean, uh, most of them fall under the Nintendo header too, right? There's That's Zelda. What I'm yeah, exactly. There's Zelda. There's Mario. I would say the one exception outside of it is probably Grand Theft Auto. Uh, I guess Halo. Yeah. You could kind of put in that. God of War, but they haven't released any for a long time. Yeah, but I was yeah, surprised. The, call. the last God of, God of War three came out in 2010. Is that amazing to you? I can't believe that's seven crazy. years ago. Ugh, it's been almost a that's decade. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. But other than that, I can't think of any that's especially any that jump from platform to platform right. that have remained consistent. You know, that was a big that was a big mis- misstep for Bioware hadn't transitioned to these new platforms well at all. I believe they struggle with Dragon Age Inquisition. There's a lot of people in Dragon Age Inquisition. A lot of people enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I'm on the fence about it. I didn't like it at all. Solas or Soros or whatever that dude. I just couldn't stand that character. That character single handedly ruined that game for me. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have Mass Effect Andromeda, which was just a colossal failure. Just, and they just did not handle the transition to these new generation of systems well at all. So is this enough to say that Mass Effect is probably, this is the end of it? I mean... No. Well, no. well Bioware has Anthem coming out. If Anthem really takes off, why would they revisit Mass Effect? Well, they can, because they can come out with Mass Effect 4. And Mass Effect Andromeda was a spinoff. Right. And they, this was the game that you could fail with. Just like Dragon Inquisition is a game you could fail with because you can still come out with your other. It's like Rogue One. Rogue One could have been a colossal failure and no one would have cared. In my eyes, it was a colossal failure. 
Whoa, really? I really don't like that movie at all. You don't like that movie? No, I don't want to get off on a whole thing, but Rogue One to me is the Mass Effect Andromeda of the Star Wars series. Well, see, then that's a good comparison. Do you think Rogue One was enough to ruin the entire Star Wars? No, and I mean, it clearly has, and we're still going to get a million Star Wars, including a Jabba the Hutt standalone, so yay for that. Right, and that's why I don't think Mass Effect... Look, the two, the first three Mass Effects were strong enough where you could have a, mis- a misstep. And I don't think Mass Effect 3 was that big of a colossal fail that everyone says it was. I think a couple people were just... Not a couple. A lot of people were upset that they felt that their choices didn't matter. But when if you take that promise out of Mass Effect, it was still... The story that was told was still very, very well told. And the trilogy altogether stands up, and it's a very well told trilogy. So I think they they can afford a mishap. Right. I also wonder how much of these things play into when you make the first game. Look, Mass Effect Two is better than Mass Effect One uh, almost across the board, but Mass Effect One really blew up a lot of things. Just like, what is this game? Where did this come from? This amazing story for me to actually feel like I was living Star Wars in like an alternate Star Wars again. It was just a, it was a phenomenal game. Um, it was a phenomenal game with a phenomenal plot, and yeah. when you think of the, that Mass Effect story, the game, it was unlike anything you've seen before. Right. And I, even the ending, the anti-hero villain, and what, what would you call it? The villain that you feel sympathy for. What right. is that name? What is that trope name in media, Hollywood? Well, I don't know what the trope name is. He's not an anti-hero, really. He's, he's not like, an anti-hero, no. He's, he's, he's a just a that sympathetic sorry villain. For. Yeah, exactly. There we go. Sympathetic villain. So... And you never saw any video games do that before. It's I I don't I don't know I don't think Mass Effect I don't think we can say the series is dead. And I think I think it's very disrespectful for anyone to say that that series is dead. Well, well, I'm sorry. I apologize to everyone at Bioware. Um, thank thank you. I I accept your Bioware apology <laughs> on behalf of everyone at Bioware. Um, I just think that they set the bar so incredibly high with their first game, but in a good way. You know, it's it's really hard to live up to a masterpiece like that. And then if you don't, you still you have that brand loyalty for a long time. I think it takes more than one game that's kind of a dud to sink a brand yeah. like that. They did nice to the over public, man. Like, what yeah, else do you on. need? You came out with the... Gr- calm down. Calm In down my childhood, you. until... I don't know, man. I love that game like it was a child of mine. I love the over... I still remember where I was when that reveal happened. When you find out that you're playing as Revan the entire... I just... Man. Well, that builds up a lot of good faith. And also... Jade I mean, Empire. So, come on now. God, I'm I love Jade Empire so much. Look, we'll see. They got likely... I mean, this is the buzz and what I would imagine is that Anthem will release some new game footage um, at Gamescom. We hope so, right? Yeah, I, I really hope so. It'd be very bizarre to me if they didn't do that. And Anthem, from what I saw, at E3 looks amazing. Yeah, if you like fl- games where you're flying around in a jetpack. But yeah, we'll see. Uh, I'm excited. Um, the, it looked beautiful. The flying mechanics looked awesome. I re- They really need to come out with some gameplay footage. Because every all the stories that came out from Bioware these last, what, three, four years have been not good stories. Right, so they need they need a win. The thing is, I'm, I'm sure they'll show some gameplay footage. But I'm not even just excited about the way it looks, the gameplay footage. I'm excited because the guy who wrote some of my favorite video games... Uh, who's a novelist, is back to write Anthem again, uh, and that's Drew Carpesian. And that bodes well for a series that I kind of only... I don't only like them because of their stories, but their stories are the main reasons why I bought these games and why I played these games. It wasn't the gameplay. Yeah, it wasn't the gameplay. No. The gameplay for the first couple were great, but they kind of stayed the same. Yeah, they weren't you, bad. They you just stay weren't. for those big story moments and those big choices and those moments that you're like, "Wow, this is I'm man, I'm playing a motion picture right now, right? A good motion picture right now." I'm not playing Speed Two. Don't knock Speed Two, bro. That's a pretty good one. I'd say in the Speed series. Which definitely... one was Speed Two? I would see that's was just when my they're on the boat. Good lord! It sounds your bullock in that one. Sandra Bullock is, but Keanu Reeves isn't. They got Sandra Bullock Oscar winner, but they couldn't get back point break Keanu Reeves. I imagine Gamescom is going to show some Anthem footage. I hope that we'll get a little bit more of the story because I'm intrigued by the um, the freelancer aspect of it where you're kind of like a, a gun for hire in space, which doesn't sound as like groundbreaking as you'd think it was, but it, it looks like they're doing something fun and cool with it. I guess. I don't know anything about this game. Nobody just- does. 
I don't know anything about this game. It's a mystery. <laughs> Joining me now is uh, Steve Gaynor, co-founder of Fulbright Games, or Fulbright Company, I guess is how you would say it. How, how, what actually is the name of the company? Is it just Fulbright? <laughs> <laughs> it's simply Fulbright. Gotcha. Yeah. Co-founder of Fulbright. Uh, Fulbright has just released a great new game called Tacoma, uh, and Steve is nice enough to come on and talk to us about the game. How's the uh, reception been so far for uh, Tacoma? Yeah, I mean, it, we, we've been very happy with it. Um, I, I think that... Uh, you know, our games are about um, telling a story in an environment and, and giving the player the ability to, to kind of get to know these characters through exploring these places. And we've really seen people, um, I don't know, connecting with, with the characters, with the crew of Tacoma and wanting to spend more time with them. So that's been that's been really cool to see. I'm glad you talked about the setting because I had read that originally it was supposed to be set uh, in a far less futuristic type setting and that it was supposed to be set in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, and then you guys yeah. changed it because of similarities to your last game, Gone Home. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that decision to make it uh, more of a space setting? Yeah, we, uh, you know, our first game, um, Gone Home, uh, took place in 1995 in Oregon. And it was, you know, very much a story about a family. Uh, you're exploring a, a house, um, a, you know, domestic setting. And, um, you know, we started kind of exploring further down that road with the original version of Tacoma. And it just, you know, for our follow-up game, for our next thing, it just felt too close um, for, for us. And we wanted to push ourselves further to kind of have to explore territory that we weren't already familiar with. Um, and so, yeah, you know, a couple months after we started working on the game, we decided to move to a sci-fi setting, move to a futuristic setting, we give ourselves the challenge of having to do more of the creative work of world building and kind of figuring out what is the year 2088 like um, in, in our kind of speculative fiction view. And so hopefully that also gave players a new experience of kind of what we do as a company. Um, because, yeah, we, we wanted to, to kind of push ourselves further with, with our follow-up to come home. Right. Well, we see with a lot of indie publishers now, and you guys are absolutely no exception, that there seems to be a lot more, not just boundary pushing, but uh, doing things where your follow-up game does not directly reflect back on your first game. So are you guys trying to always kind of reinvent yourself with every new game that comes out? I mean, you've only had two so far, but they are, they're, ve they're in the same vein, but they are very different yeah. games. Um. It's a little of each, you know. I think that um, what we want to do is continue building on the foundation that we have, um, but also to, to ensure that, you know, it doesn't just feel like we're repeating ourselves. Because I think that one of the big things that really made Gone Home uh, kind of turn into a, a runaway hit when it came out for us was that, you know, people didn't really feel like they had played a game like that before, either talking about those themes or just with that kind of story focus and level of interactivity with the environment. Um, and so, you know, with Tacoma, we wanted to say, how do we build on that foundation and make something that feels like a legitimately new experience, um, but that draws from what we're good at and what we know how to do and kind of what, you know, people have... Uh, have learned to expect from us on some level, but you know it, it is that um, that tension of not wanting to just go totally outside of your you know known realm of, of kind of what you're capable of mm -hmm. and and where your interests lie and kind of like what you're naturally good at, but also you know not just like okay we're going to do the same thing again but you know with a new coat of paint um, right. and so finding what that means. Is a, is a big design challenge. Um, it's sort of a fundamentally uh, challenging uh, set of rapids to, to navigate. One thing that's fun about the game is it kind of hints at conventions that are found in these types of exploration or adventure games, but kind of tweaks it a little bit. Uh, mm. it, was, it was really fun to come along old logs, but also be able to rewind them and relive the same situation. And you kind of are watching a lot of people that had already been there before, and you get to now interact with it. Uh, How'd you guys come up with that type of idea for... I don't think I've ever seen video logs done in the same way that this game does it. Where it's, it feels like a fresh take on it. That, that's great, yeah. I mean, that, that was what we wanted to be able to say was... Yeah, you know, that's, that's a very similar... I would say that comes from a similar place that we came from with Gone Home, which is to say, 
you know, audio diaries um, are like a very known concept now where you kind of you know, find some object and then you, you hear a, a little kind of radio recording of something that happened to a character. But, you know, with Gone Home, we said if we make finding these diaries and we make the experience of them and of the environment that they're in, kind of the whole experience, the core mechanic of the game, instead of kind of a side thing that you do while you're playing an RPG or a shooter game Mm -hmm. or something, then that can be its own new experience. I think it's a similar thing with Tacoma was to say, you know, it's not like we've never seen in a video game, you know, some mechanic where you encounter a hologram and you see kind of a, a replay of something that happened in the past, but taking that and turning it into the core mechanic and the thing that the game is about Mm -hmm. kind of requires you to think about how to expand on that and how to make it kind of have more depth and and have the player be more directly involved with it. And so like you were saying, you know, being in the middle of these kind of sprawling scenes that contain many characters that are all moving in parallel and then giving the player the ability to move through that timeline while they explore the space, I think really involves you in a way with what's going on that, you know, like, like you said, hopefully people play it and they feel like this is a unique take on this kind of experience and something they haven't played before. Right. It's also a great way for storytelling to get the story across. And what's fun about these games is that I think a lot of creators are kind of moving to video games or we're seeing it now as a medium to really tell different stories, more in-depth stories where I really make a, an emotional connection to the types of characters. And you guys are definitely uh, doing that with a lot of your games. Uh, do you think that there's an industry push towards more storytelling in video games, or do you think it's more on the indie side? Uh, I mean, obviously there's big tentpole franchises that are doing stuff like that, but indie games are almost like reading short novels at this point that you can interact yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know what you mean. Um, I think that I think that, that there's something that's, that interesting that's been going on over the last you know five or ten years, which is that... You know the the means of production and the means of distribution for for video games have really opened up with more tools that people have access to either for free or cheap and for with being able to just digitally distribute your games without having to get a lot of approvals and so I think that what we're seeing is a lot of people who kind of have this interest or or see this potential for using games to tell stories and to to get people closer to to these fictional characters actually having the ability to kind of just make those things and get them out there. And, you know, the audience reacts to it and people, you know, are excited about these things when they have access to them. And I think that ends up expanding out into larger games. You know, you see the influence of games like Firewatch or Gone Home or Dear Esther, even on things like, you know, the Uncharted series or like, uh, I, I was, it was very surreal. Um, earlier this year to see the director of the next Call of Duty game say that Gone Home was an influence on how they wanted to approach these story sequences in in the next Call of Duty. Um, But I think it's it's one of those things where it's like, there just needed to be that point where people who had these ideas that couldn't, like, in the past be approved by a big publisher, just get them out there and and become part of kind of what we do with Mm -hmm. video games. Um... But I think that overall, it's less of a monolithic, you know, like, games are doing this now, and more of, we are seeing all these different, you know, kinds of uh, game experiences kind of expand and, and broaden. Right. Um, and it's, it's just sort of, I think, made the discussion of kind of what games are doing larger in a way that is, is really cool to see. Yeah, I think related to that, you know, having so many new voices and different stories being able to, to-, uh, to be told... Uh, you guys also have introduced LGBT issues and characters into uh, both of your games now, which is something we're seeing yeah. a, a bit more representation of in video games. But is that something of importance to you guys to try and push those types of uh, stories into your games? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, what we what we want to be able to do is to uh, you know um, have more different kinds of characters and more perspectives be a part of of what we do with our games. And I think that we don't start from a point of saying, okay, we want to make a game that's about this kind of character or this demographic or, or you know this issue. But the flip side of it is when we start 
working and my my story partner and co-founder Carla and I start looking at, at saying okay well who are the specific people in this story you know what what are the the, the specifics that, that this game is going to be about you know if we say well this kind of character is interesting to us this you know queer character or this a person from this religious background or whatever seems like it would be interesting to talk about to not shy away from that and to invest in representing those experiences in a way that's hopefully you know respectful and Mm -hmm. and authentic um because i think that it is a really good thing from a creative standpoint to be able to talk about a broader cast of characters and people that that kind of experience the world differently Mm -hmm. and then from a player perspective we know that it's important to people to see themselves represented in the games they play and we've been really um grateful in a way to be able to have the freedom to put these kinds of characters in our games and then see that people who play them uh really have a a connection with kind of seeing themselves in in a video game when maybe they they normally don't um so i would say it's important to us uh for a lot of reasons um and yeah like you know like you were saying it's something that i think that we are starting to see more of in games broadly you know like from small indie games to games like overwatch you know where it's like okay they have a very diverse cast of characters and that's something that the audience really responds to um and the fact that that game creators feel like they can include more of these kinds of people in what they make um i think is is really an inspiring part of the direction that the games are going in great uh you guys have also had a female protagonist in both of your games was that something I guess similar to what you just said, was that something that you started off with? Like, that was the idea from the get-go? With Gone Home, it's so tied into the story. Uh, With Tacoma, it is as well, but I don't want to say less so, but in a a less direct way than, I guess, Gone Home was. So was it always the idea to have Amanda be the main character in Tacoma? Um, You know, like, with stuff like that, in some cases... Well, so, like you're saying, in Gone Home, I feel like, you know, it was... You know, Carla and I talked about how it was relevant mm-hmm. that there's kind of a, I mean, every family's different, but in a lot of cases, there's sort of a different relationship between sisters and playing the older sister of Sam and having her addressing her diary to you felt like something that was natural and kind of um, spoke to the player's experience in that game. Um, but, you know, like the flip side of it is the, you know, Carla and I work fairly intuitively in making a lot of these decisions. And, you know, some of it is just what character would we want to see on screen or what do we feel like doing, you know? I mean, <clears throat> pardon me. I, I think that because um, some things you can say are calculated or kind of you're doing for specific reasons. And I think some are just, you know, what do I want to do as a creator? What do I, what do I, who do I picture this character being? just kind of naturally that that comes out of my head. Um, And I I assume that it's a fairly similar kind of place that someone like uh, Hayao Miyazaki from from Ghibli, you know, he had so many um, uh, female protagonists in his uh, films. And I feel like, you know, it's a similar thing where some of it is relevant to the fiction and and what you want to do with it. And maybe, you know, in a film like uh, Kiki's Delivery Service, it's like, okay, well, she's a young witch, she's a girl there's a reason for that for a lot of kind of like trope or um you know uh, mythology reasons but then sometimes it's just like this is the character that that i feel like putting on screen and let's see who she is and that's a role that you can inhabit in our game so i don't know comes from a lot of places i guess (laughs) (laughs) i got you uh do you guys have any plans for your next game yet are you guys just kind of taking a break a much deserved break after the release (laughs) of this one I mean, it's a little of both, right? Like, we don't have specific plans for exactly what we're doing yet. Um, but there's only so much of a break that we can take, you know? Like, we're, we are looking at how to stay active and, and keep working on things um, between, you know, patching the game and looking at, at how we can put more out into the world um, from the games that we have without, you know, saying, okay, <laughs> right back on the horse. <laughs> Let's right. write a new story and, and, and get this thing going. Um and, you know, that's a, that's a thing that is a good balance to have when you're a studio that has a couple of games um, kind of in your catalog and, mm-hmm. and you can think about um, what to do with them in between big pushes for making new stuff. 
but you know, it, it's all kind of exploratory for us right now. Gotcha. All right, well, thank you so much for coming on, Steve. I really appreciate it. Congratulations. The game is really fun. Oh, cheers. Thank you for playing. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Have a great day. What are you excited for at Gamescom? Anthem. Is there anything else? Or is it just Shadow. Anthem all the I way? I want to see some Shadow of Colossus gameplay. I know I'm biased and everyone's like, it's a remake, but I love that game. I just want to see what it looks like. I would like to see if Nintendo, they kind of have to. I was, I, I've been down on Nintendo a lot these last these last couple of podcasts, and I haven't been down on them at all in the last, like maybe the last four. But in the beginning of the podcast, I was really down on them. But they released Splatoon two, that kind of shut me up. <laughs> but they really, they really need to motivate their base. So I think they really need to stretch a message prime for any type of footage. Any type of footage, even if it's gameplay, not even gameplay, even if it's movie footage of, like, they need to show something. If they give us anything outside of just a poster, like they did at E3, I mean, if you just see Samus walking, that will be enough to send the internet into a frenzy. I, I mean, just like, I don't, some, you're right, something. I yeah. just need to see something that's not just scroll text. Well, you said it last week, and it was a perfect analogy that. Nintendo's really the Disney of video games, and they own all these massive properties. And it's just like what was happening at Comic-Con or any other time that Disney wants to do anything. Disney just says, like, we have Marvel and we have Star Wars. You don't even have to see it. We already have you. And, like, Nintendo has that, too. So they can release the smallest little bits of things and just blow people away just by the very nature of it existing. So... Uh, I don't know. I, I guess you, if you're going to show up at these things, it's always good to like drum up some publicity. But again, like you said, they don't have to really show that much at all of Metroid, and it will blow people away, just the I, fact that it exists. I just need, it's, need to see what you said. I just need to see something that makes me believe that it's going to come out within the next 50 years. Right. That is real, and that it exists. That it's not just like some exactly. specter. Yeah. I want to see just something, something that makes me think, okay, they're actually making this game, and they didn't just throw something up to appease the people f- to buy this system. So, and you know, they the clamoring for the system's there. It's selling extremely well. People are act- absolutely excited about it. So, I, you don't really need to show it, but you need to show it, if that makes any sense. I mean, it's a contradiction, but yes, I do understand what you're saying. Like, you don't really need to show it because you're Nintendo. You don't really need to do anything. Right. Because, like you said, people are going to be excited. But you really need to show it in terms of doubters like myself who've been loyal forever. And there are not many like me who are sick of being promised these titles and getting these 2D platformers. I hate you know? this attitude where people feel like, oh, I'm, I'm owed it, you know. But I do feel like you kind of owe it to your fans after this long to, like... Like you said, just give it, give us something to let us know that it's real. You know, N- Nintendo is Mario, Zelda, Metroid, right? Samus, sorry, it's not Yoshi, it's not Kirby, it's not any of these other side characters that are cute and fuzzy. It is the heart of Nintendo is Super Mario, Zelda, and Samus Metroid. I, I'm sorry, you have to show something, and you have supported Zelda and you've supported Mario for the last what year couple of years it's time to support Metroid and it's been years it's it, been years it's since been you've years. gotten a game it's been years it's and this insane is, this is the best possible time that you could release a Metroid game like this is the yes. best possible time for like a badass female space marine to be released in a video game it, yeah it, it, it's just do it just show me something are you listening, so, to Nintendo? I think I would like it. to see something from God of War Two. If 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 not, then just show me some Spider Man. Just give me some more Spider Man. Spoil the whole game for me. I don't care. If it's one hundred percent Spider Man, I'd be all right. Spider Man looks amazing. Spider Man looks, and I love Spider Man. Give me all the Spider Man. I saw some Battlefront Two footage from like they they released some Starfighter footage. That game looks phenomenal. Oh my gosh. I can't wait, because so. Battlefront 1, for me, was a bit of a letdown. 
Yeah, yeah, I loved it still because it was Star Wars and I like the sound effects. I can't lie, <laughs> but yeah, it, I, I agree. It was a letdown. Buy a PlayStation Four before Battlefront comes out. I'm gonna have a crew on my PlayStation Four. You need to get on that. Violin. I need to get on that. But yeah, I'm excited for that. But we'll see. Gamescom is just kind of like new, and it's a lot of gameplay footage. So yeah, it's if sort they of that festival themselves. Yeah. You know, you need to show some good stuff like Beyond Good and Evil 2. That would be like amazing. And you got to have that one exclusive, you know, that one thing that you guys are debuting that nobody else has debuted. It's got to be. Um, but I just said I Beyond Good be and huge. Evil 2. I don't know what other game you could show gameplay footage that's going to make people go crazy over. With the exception of possibly Metroid 4, I don't think there is a game. Oh, right, 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 right. You know, we got a Shenmue 3 trailer today, which was, I loved it, but a lot of people, not a lot, most people are complaining about it. So, that's the only other game that I could think would get people clamoring for Gamescom. Well, so. yeah, maybe, I mean, but let's not act like Shenmue is anywhere close to what Metroid Shut up, <laughs> Shenmue is a worldwide phenomenon, and one of the greatest things ever created, and if you ever ever say have anything negative come out of your mouth about Shenmue again I will roll over there and smack your ass <laughs> smack you Shenmue style yeah yeah but yeah you're right it's not gonna <laughs> you're just gonna have your hardcore fans excited about it but well I guess you fall under that banner yeah just me too probably oh, I'm just, probably you alone person. in a line I'm excited for Shenmue Whatever, I'll sit in this corner and eat my cake by myself. I don't need anybody. Well, you say cake like it's not Sour Patch Kids. It's cake, Sour Patch Kids. Sour Patch Cake. That's, That's really an idea right there. Oh, my there God. There you go. No one can have any of it. I'm starting a restaurant. That's all we're selling. Well, as always, Eddie, I'd like to know what you've been playing this last week uh, and what sticks out for you on your S- Xbox and PlayStation. Slime Rancher. Oh, sorry, what was that? Slime. Slime Rancher. I'm sorry, one more time. You're ranching some... S- slime Rancher. Oh, Slime Rancher. Sorry, I thought you said something that made sense. Slime Rancher. You ranch as slimes. Explain this game to me, because I, I literally do not understand this game. I watched your footage of you playing, and I still don't get what this game is. We have a gameplay video on our Twitch. If you're wondering about the free Xbox One game this month, what? it is Slime Rancher. It is also on PC. I believe it's twenty dollars on PC. I almost bought it, and then I saw that it was free on Xbox, and I went and downloaded it. It is getting rave reviews. Everyone's going crazy over it. So, Slime Rancher is you farm, you you ranch slimes, you farm slimes. So you go out and you catch slimes, you you collect their poop essentially, and you sell their poop for money. The slimes poop. You, yeah, this. Well, it's not slime poop. They call a plorts. But you feed the slimes, and after you feed worse. the slime, these plorts pop out. Ew. And let's be real. When you eat, what happens? You digest that food. So it's basically, it's essentially slime poop that you're harvesting, selling for money that you can use to upgrade your farm, upgrade your player that you're playing, unlock new areas. This, sound like, <laughs> this sounds like some crazy pervert's like GoFundMe account like about a video game. I want to make this game where it's a bunch of slimes and they poop, and you pick up the poop and sell it to the townsfolk. I could totally see that's how they came up with this game, because this idea behind it is so simple, right? You're just going around, you're sucking these slimes up with your vacuum cleaner, you're going back and you're plopping these slimes back out in these corrals, and you're essentially just feeding them and raising them. They don't even get older, you're just feeding them, and then you're feeding them to make money. The more you feed them, the more money you make. And then if you feed them their favorite food, you get even more money. So it's just about making money and making money and making money, farming slimes. So it's really – it's a tribute to capitalism with slime. Yeah, it is. It's just – it's a basic tutorial on capitalism. Well, I'm so – I'm all for it. I loved it. I didn't think I was going to like it this much. I ended up putting a lot of hours into it. I did a gameplay video – this weekend, I'll probably do another one. I did some, a lot of work to my farm since I, the last video, so I'll, I'll show that, and I'll show these new slimes that I've collected. I got some honey slimes. Ooh, those are my I favorite. I have some ones. water slimes. No, those are all right. I have some kitty cat slimes. Oh, I love kitty cat slimes. I have some rock slimes. That doesn't even make sense. 
and I have some um, radioactive slimes. Well, you should stay so, away from those. There's all kinds of slimes, dude. I'm telling, and I, I have like a little raccoon slime. That's a little thief. I'm trying to find more of those. It's like Pokemon. It's like I love it. It's like Pokemon Stardew Valley. This is like the ravings of a madman, is what this sounds like to me. I, I, I love it. It's just all I want to do. Just rest the slimes. Good and old then you slimes. can like, you know, just do all kinds of nefarious stuff. So I just pick up slimes, just you know, kill them, throw them off the cliff, and then more slimes come. Just slimes everywhere. You're like, get out of here, slime, slimes. Slime. Just get out of here, slimes. And then, you you know, you can't combine more than three slimes because then you get, like, a ooze slime. And that ooze slime eats other slimes and makes more ooze slimes. And then they're bad. I so have, like, a counter water, that's dinging out. every time you say the word slime. <laughs> if you listen <laughs> to this right. podcast and you can correctly guess how many times Eddie just said the word slime, I will give you a fabulous prize. Some slime. <laughs> From my own... <laughs> My own my reserve. Own slime my own reserve. Yeah, you know, I got a lot of slimes. So, <laughs> or some slime poop. I'm sorry, the slimes aren't valuable. So, slime poop. Some plorts. And I, I'm sure there's a story behind it because people keep emailing me, and I'm reading them. I just want to make this money, dog. I'm going to make this money. You know, here to read. I'm making that slime money, dog. Making that slime money, dog. I got time to read your emails. <laughs> I'm a slime rancher. Say no, okay, Cupid. All right, thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, thanks again to our guest, uh, Steve Gaynor, for coming on the program and talking about his awesome game, Tacoma. Uh, we have some exciting stuff coming up in the future. Uh, some great guests are lined up for future podcasts. Uh, we're going to get some Gamescom news. It's going to be it's gonna be a fun week, everybody. Yeah, and please follow us on, where are we, Twitter, <laughs> Namek, Versaian, Leave us a comment. Leave us a tweet. Sorry, no comments on Twitter. <laughs> My bad. Uh, we're also on Twitch, Namek vs. Saiyan. We're also on SoundCloud, Namek vs. Saiyan. We're, we're also all on across. iTunes. So subscribe to us on iTunes. Leave a comment. Yes. Leave a review. All that stuff that beggars do. Please do it. We Please, just want to know guys. if you're listening or not, or not. We love you all. Yes, we do. Some of you. Believe. <laughs> Most of you, I'd say. Yeah, it's a good cross section. It's always like a Venn diagram. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, but that five percent in the middle of the Venn diagram stops.